welcome to the Hemlock Society of San Diego's first monthly meeting of 2022. This afternoon, we're fortunate to have as our guest, Dr. Philip Nitschke, one of the world's most well-known advocates of the right of an individual who is mentally competent uh, to end their own life when they no longer feel that life is worth living. This meeting, like all the meetings of the Hemlock Society of San Diego, is brought to you by the hard work of Hemlock members and volunteers. And in those of you who are friends of the Hemlock Society, who contribute financially, um, all of that helps us bring these programs to you. And we hope that if you believe as we do, that a competent, mentally competent individual chooses to end their own life and they are old enough to understand the consequences of that choice, that they should be entitled to a peaceful death. That should be a fundamental right, a fundamental human right. If you believe that as strongly as we do, we hope you'll support us by going to our webpage at hemlocksocietyofsandiego.org and either contributing or becoming a member of the Hemlock Society, and perhaps even working as a volunteer with us to help bring other programs like this to people uh, who need to hear this information. Thank you. Without further ado, let me pass the uh, baton on to Faye Gersh, our uh, society's founder, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about our particularly interesting guest, Dr. Philip Nitschke. Faye? Thanks, Barry. I first met Philip in 1996 at a world conference in Melbourne, just starting my tenure as head of the National Hemlock Society. Never one to shy away from controversy, Philip had just become the first person in the world to help someone achieve a lawful, peaceful death. That's quite an accomplishment. The Rights of the Terminally Ill Act, or ROTI, had been passed by the Parliament of the Northern Territory in 1995. That's in Australia. No doctor, however, would step up to comply with its measures, which allowed a doctor to administer a lethal injection to a seriously ill person at their request. In September 1996, Philip helped Bob Dent die with Bob's wife, Judy, by his side. He had terminal prostate cancer. Judy, by the way, is still an active supporter in the Northern Territory, which in 1997, lost the right to enact that law by the federal parliament. And there is now serious uh, consideration of restoring the, the rights, uh, right of the Terminally Act to uh, the Northern Territory. Undaunted though, Philip ran unsuccessfully for the federal parliament and has continued his fight to the present with Exit International, an organization he founded that year in 1997 to bring his fight to people around the world. To describe all the things he has done since then would take the entire time. Here are a few accomplishments. Philip has an MD and a PhD in physics. In 2015, though, he burned his medical practicing certificate in response to what he saw as an onerous, onerous conditions that violated his right to free speech by the Medical Board of Australia. He now lives with his wife, Fiona Stewart, on a houseboat in Holland. I think that's right, Philip. He and Fiona wrote the Peaceful Pill Handbook, which is available in hard copy and online and in four languages, but banned in New Zealand and Australia. He can tell you the details. He has two other books to his credit, Damned If I Do, his autobiography, and Killing Me Softly. He's now known as a comedian since his routine Dicing with Dr. Death at the Edinburgh Festival. He was also involved in the film Mademoiselle and the Doctor about a healthy 79 year old woman who wanted not to become 80. We showed that at our Right to Die film series. He is the inventor of the euthanasia machine, the code genie, the nitrogen method, long storage nebutol, and now the Sarco, approved for use in Switzerland. I'm sure he'll talk about all these things. 
For his inventiveness, he's be, be called the Elon Musk of assisted dying. He's also a player in the new right to die organization, Pegasus, which has now been used by people in San Diego. He rejects the medical model in favor of a civil rights model, essentially believing that suicide is a right. This view has not been endorsed uh, by the majority of people in the right to die movement, as well as his opponents, still leaving him immersed in controversy, which he doesn't mind, I think. He was a recipient of the Australian Humanist uh, of the Year Award in 1998, so he has many admirers. The only time he was in San Diego that I recall, he was a speaker at the last National Hemlock Meeting in 2003 where he received a standing ovation. We are delighted to have him with us today and to discuss his philosophy, to talk about what's on your mind, what's going on with Exit International, and to answer your questions. Welcome, Philip. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Faye, and I'm speaking to you from a houseboat here in the Netherlands, <laughs> and it's uh, 10.30 at night, and I'm very glad to be able to join everybody over there and talk a little bit about an issue which has clearly dominated a large part of my life. It's a long time, as Faye's just pointed out, some 20, more than 25 years that we've been involved in this issue. And some people have said to me, well, if you've been involved in an issue for 25 years, you can't be making much of a difference because clearly the issue's still there. And it has, but I suppose what I could say is that there's been quite an evolution in that period of time. And certainly it's very easy from my own point of view to plot the changes that have taken place in my own thinking. And my position now, which has been mentioned by Faye's kind, in Faye's kind introduction, is a little different from the one that I started out at so many years ago. These days, I do have that belief, as was suggested there, that it is a fundamental right for a person to be able to take this step and access a peaceful elective death at the time of their choosing. Uh, and that by being a fundamental right, and I contrast that with the I, what, how I would describe the medical model, which is by and large sweeping around the world, where I describe that as uh, essentially a medical privilege granted by usually some adjudicating bodily body like a, a panel of doctors for the very sick. In other words, a medical privilege versus a human right. And this idea of the rights model, that is, it is your right to get access to the best way to take this step, independent of reason. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to be anything. You just have to be a person who wants to die. We say effectively there's only two criteria. This is my thinking now. It wasn't when I started so many years ago, but my conditions now really are you have to be an adult. Children don't understand necessarily the permanence of death. And you have to be a person of sound mind. That is, you have to have that nebulous quality, which we describe as mental capacity. And of course, much of my time these days is spent trying to tease out exactly what mental capacity is. And uh, I guess we might get more into that when people start asking questions. But and as far as I, my belief is, and I suppose we reflect that in our organization, Exit International, we do see those as being the only criteria, mental capacity and uh, age. And they're pretty, age is easy to establish, but mental capacity certainly isn't. This idea, as we would say, of medical models which try to codify the degree of sickness and suffering, which really is what's happened in the models that are sweeping around the world. And I've been watching very closely in Australia just recently as the states of Australia are now falling over themselves to try and introduce legislation, given how quickly they managed to get rid of that very embryonic first piece that I used back in 1996. Nowadays, Australia is scrambling to try and catch up with the rest of the world. But the pieces of legislation that are coming in are medical model laws. And uh, politician after politician are effectively saying, these are proudly, this is the most conservative legislation in the world that we are about to introduce. And by and large, they're right. It is the most conservative legislation. And when I look at those pieces of law, I think they're also effectively the most unworkable pieces of legislation. Uh, so we're seeing a changes occur around the world and not necessarily that many people or those even involved in the right to die movement endorse this position that I've just mentioned, that this is a fundamental human right. But I, I like to try and argue that point, and uh, I guess uh, we will find people who will agree and disagree with it uh, when we talk further this, uh, this evening. Now, there's been a lot of questions that have come in, and I'm very happy to explain in more detail how I 
or why I've changed my position, how I got to the current way I think. It's really been based on a number of experiences over the years, I guess. Uh, perhaps that would be worthwhile going through a little bit of that before we start questions. As I said, I started with our first piece of legislation back in 96. I hadn't been active in the movement at all. I woke up one day where I was working as a doctor in the Northern Territory, relatively recent doctor, I might add. I went back to medical school as a geriatric student to retrain. And I came back up to Darwin, my home, and I was working there. And when I heard one day there was to be a new law that would allow a doctor to help a terminally ill person to die. I thought, good idea, rolled over and went back to sleep. Uh, and I was just totally amazed at what happened in the next week. We had an outpouring of opposition, mostly, of course, from the church, but much to my surprise, from my new profession. The medical profession of Australia came out and said there isn't a doctor in the Northern Territory who will have anything to do with such a law. This is, a, this is something that the medical profession can never support. In fact, they went as far as to say, we will make sure such a law never passes. When I heard that, I was totally surprised. I thought it was, as I said, a good idea. I certainly knew that I would have liked it. I thought if I was in the position of being terminally ill, surely I would like to have that option. And I was rather surprised about the intensity of the opposition from the profession manifest through organisations such as the Australian Medical, uh, Medical Association and the like. So I got involved effectively politically because it was looking as though, even though it was very popular with the people of the Northern Territory, it was looking as though uh, they were starting to waver, even though the majority of people thought good idea with the doctors all out there saying this is a dreadful idea. Many people were starting to think, well, maybe these doctors know something that we don't know. They were saying they, we really, we really don't think you should go down this path. And people were starting to waver. So I became involved politically and I took on that idea that there isn't a doctor in the territory prepared to use such law. And I managed to, after, with some effort, find some 20 other doctors out of the 700 who were in the territory at the time, prepared to put their names to a full page ad in the local press saying, look, it's not quite true that there are no doctors. There are only a few, but there are some, and we certainly can't we won't see the law flounder simply because of lack, of lack of support from the medical profession. So that's how I got involved politically. It hadn't been an issue that had particularly preoccupied me at all, but suddenly I found myself involved. I was very pleased when that law did pass through the parliament of the Northern Territory by just one vote. Uh, then of course the politicians all went back to sleep and it became my problem then because I was about the only doctor there who supported such a law. And people then came along and said, we want to use such a law and then it became kind of crunch time. And that's around about the time I met Faye. Uh, it was at that time when uh, we were having dreadful trouble because then I started to realize just what sort of a minefield this issue had become with the law that was passed. There were lots and lots of conditions, effectively summing it up. You just about had to be dead to qualify. You had to be very, very sick. And if you were very, very sick and sick enough, and I could find four doctors to agree with that idea that you were sick enough to die, then you could get legally a lethal injection. Well, trying to get people, trying to get other doctors to sign those bits of papers was a dreadfully difficult task. And eventually though it did happen when, as Faye mentioned, Bob Dent received a legal lethal voluntary injection. Uh, I myself at the time was starting to have concerns about the idea. I passionately believed a person should have that right but the idea of going around and delivering the lethal injection, I was not particularly enthusiastic about. Uh, it made me feel a little uncomfortable. And I thought, why should I do that when he can do this himself? And so I built a machine. And I thought, right, here's a machine. I will load the machine up with the drugs. I will put the needle, the cannula in the vein. But then the person who wants to die can press the button themselves. Look, it was a sort of a variation on Jack Kevorkian's model. I was very impressed by Jack's activities in the US at this stage. Uh, I thought his, uh, his uh, Sanitron and uh, his other devices that he was developing looked a little bit, uh, a little bit amateurish, I thought, crudely. I thought I could make it a little more sophisticated. So we had a laptop computer and it presented questions to the person who was going to die. And those questions were pretty blunt. The last one was, if you press this button, you will die. Do you wish to go ahead? And Bob Dent, the first person to use that machine, pressed that last button. 
and the drugs flowed and he died in his wife Judy's arms. And I sat there watching it from across the room. And I thought to myself, uh, this is a very important moment. And I guess it's going to change my life. And indeed it did. My life was never the same after that use of the machine. That machine and three other people used that embryonic law. It was the world's first legislation giving the option of a legal lethal administered injection by a doctor for a sick person. And three other people that made four and all used that machine to die. And then the federal government of Australia, very worried about what was going on, going on in the in the outback out there in Northern Territory, was always considered to be a little bit of a, of a place that needed close supervision by the rest of Australia, who saw it as infinitely more superior than the people who lived up in the, in the North. And they felt they should overturn the law and the federal government of Canberra did just that. The law was revoked after only eight months. So it was an important time. Uh, the law disappeared. This just preceded the introduction of the law in Oregon. Of course, you'll be aware, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware that that came in shortly thereafter. It had been held up by legal, uh, legal challenge, but it came in just after the law in Australia was overturned uh, in that brief period. The machine, we didn't know what to do with the machine. I thought, what do you do with a secondhand death machine? Uh, put it on eBay. There wasn't a lot of ideas about what one could do with such a device. I was very encouraged when I got an offer. I was contacted by the Premier Technical Museum in Australia, the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. And they said, we want the machine. I thought, good. And then immediately in Canberra, there was an outpouring of uh, comments by various politicians. And the one that sticks in my mind was one particular well-known politician who said he didn't want the children of the nation being traumatized by that obscenity. Uh, and the Powerhouse Museum, very uh, dependent on government funding, got colder and colder feet. And in the end, uh, simply contacted me. In fact, the curator of the medical displays there rang me and she said, look, if I was you, renege on the deal. Because she said, if we get this machine, it'll be buried, it'll be put in a back room and it'll never see the light of day until things calm down. And I said, uh, how long is that likely to be? And she said, at my estimate, it could be another 20 years. <laughs> then that was the intensity of the feeling in Australia over this whole issue of helping people who were sick to end their lives. So I took her advice and I reneged on the deal. And then I was, I was contacted almost immediately by the British Museum, the Science Museum in London. And they said, we want the machine. And I was only too glad to get on a plane and get over to London. And I'm not, and I pleased to see it now sits in its glass case, looking resplendent in a place where, as I sit there occasionally when I go to London and see it, thousands of school children file past looking at it, seemingly untraumatized by the obscenity. And uh, it's, it's a euthanasia device circa 1996 Darwin, Australia. Anyway, we lost the law. We went back into the dark ages with legislation pretty much the same as everywhere in the world, except Oregon, which had come in. Uh, people didn't, however, stop wanting to ask for help. They kept coming along saying they had seen what was possible and they certainly didn't think we should stop. Uh, and the law had changed. It had gone back to implementing very serious penalties for anyone who might assist a suicide. Two of the states of Australia still had the most serious penalties even possible under their legislative framework, that is life imprisonment as a possible penalty for assisting a suicide. And a total, uh, total, uh, a total inconsistency in the law where suicide was not a crime, but assistance was not just a little crime, it was a serious crime. And so we had to be careful. We looked at ways to deal with this issue. And I thought perhaps the best thing we should do is start publicizing information so people could start taking this step themselves and we published, and that's when we published the handbook, uh, which has become quite a helpful handbook around the world, the Peaceful Pill Handbook, to summarize the information on giving people the option so that they can take this step themselves, making sure they had access to the most accurate information, which drugs do work, which ones don't, how do you get them, how do you store them, how do you take them, what are the risks, what are the problems, what are the mistakes you can so easily fall into. So the idea of publicizing information was very important. I thought we published the book. The book was immediately or pretty well immediately. Well, first it was given a provisional, a provisional acceptance by our Office of Film and Literature Classification in Australia, then immediately challenged by the Attorney General of Australia because we have governmental uh, 
oversight of decisions by independent bodies, a little bit like we've just seen in the implementation of the minister overturning Novak Djokovic's uh, uh, attempts to try and play in the uh, play in the um, Australian Australian tennis coming up in the next few days. But we had the governmental minister overturning this particular decision. The book was banned. The only book banned in Australia in the last 50 years, which as many people have said, that's quite an achievement. I felt kind of proud in a way to have, have managed to write something that was so bad that it was considered to be necessary to ban. But of course, it wasn't banned in the US and we published immediately in America. We moved straight across then and started publishing in America and then running online. And in this period of time, my position started to change. And I'll just give one example so that we can get onto the questions about why that decision was affected. I started out with this original position of believing passionately in the person's right and accepting that the medical model approach was a good way to administer such a right. If you were sick enough, if you satisfied the conditions and you were able to convince some adjudicating body that you were eligible, a doctor could then come along and help you die, perhaps with administration or provision of drugs that you might take yourself orally, or perhaps with the use of a lethal injection. My position changed when people started to come to me with non-medical reasons asking for help to die. And my initial position was saying it was along the lines, well, I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, these are non-medical reasons. And I'll give you an example of the first one. And if you've seen that film that Faye mentioned, Mademoiselle and the Doctor, a person who was 76 came along and said, I want to die in four years time. And I said, why? What sort of a sickness have you got? It must be a very interesting one. It's got such a clear trajectory. And she said, I'm not sick at all. She said, but 80 is the time to die. She was a retired academic in the University of Western Australia, a French woman. And I argued with her and I said, you're not sick. Uh, and she, I, but she said, look, it's nothing to do with you. And I, I, it's my decision. Every year I went back there thinking she'd change her mind. I didn't really believe her, but then it was three years and it was two years. And finally she said, when are you gonna give me information about drugs? I wanna die next year, I'm 80. And I said, for goodness sake, Lisette, you're not sick. Why don't you go on a world cruise? Why don't you write a book? And she said, why don't you just mind your own business? She said, this has got nothing to do with you. She said, you, you run around Australia, you decide who you're going to help, you dole out bits of information to people who satisfy your criteria. You're the worst example of, of, of medical paternalism, it, insufferable medical paternalism. You said, you act like a judge. She's got nothing to do with you. It could have been the other way around. She was an academic. She, she said, you could have, I could have studied something that you did. You could have been sitting here asking me, what gives you the right to judge who gets access to good information? All as I want from you is information about drugs. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't sit here trying to judge my reasons. And I think when she said that, and the accusation of a worst case of insufferable medical paternalism, I crumpled and immediately gave her all the information she wanted and she died on her 80th birthday and caused a huge furor in the public in Australia when it became known. And of course, people said, here we see it in action, the slippery slope. One minute he's talking about helping terminally ill people. Now he's out there helping people that aren't even sick. And that still persists today, this idea that if you bring in legislation, and I'm sure you've all heard this argument, before long there'll be a slippery slope and the conditions will all change and the whole place will just uh, go to hell in a handbasket. A lot of, much the same way as people often describe the situation here in the Netherlands, that it started off as a very controlled medical piece of legislation. And now, of course, it's considered to be extremely flexible. Well, it's not that flexible, as I'll talk about, I'm sure, when the questions start. But nevertheless, what became clear to me was that uh, Lisette Nigo had a very good case. That this idea that we should be doling out information to people that some other body determines, uh, determining our eligibility didn't fit comfortably with me. And that's when I started to move towards this idea of people should have this as a right and that should never be a decision that I have to make. I don't want to set myself up as some sort of judge. As I said, the criteria I am satisfied with are very simple, that you have to be of sound mind, have mental capacity, and you have to be an adult. The other example, which has come up a lot and is coming up more and more these days, interestingly, is the situation of couples who want to die together. And of course, we have the situation where, where one person may well be very sick, a couple that have been together for many years, and the partner wants to die at the same time. 
Now I've been involved in a lot of these situations as recently as a couple of weeks ago when we took a couple of people from the Netherlands to Switzerland to take that step. And that was an example of the problems in under medical model legislation, that's simply not possible. The, the, in this situation, this recent situation, the couple, he was very sick, uh, he, wasn't, he was dying uh, and would have easily got permission to get help to die under the very, uh, very effective legislation here in the Netherlands, but his wife wasn't sick. But she said, we've been together for many years and I want to die with him. Now, that's just not possible under the Dutch law. You may be able to find some doctors who would try to argue, well, you must be a bit sick and let's try and make or manufacture or fabricate some form of medical criteria which we could possibly manage to see as being acceptable under Dutch law. But it was difficult and they decided to simply take the option of going to Switzerland because Switzerland has this unique rights-based legislation. In fact, it's the only place in the world that does, which is why we spend a lot of time in Switzerland. Anyway, that's really by, by way of background there. Um, my position now is I'm pretty comfortable with this idea that it should be a right, although I must say I watch with dismay as I see more and more of these laws pass around the world. And I guess we're seeing it through the various states of America now. Medicalized laws, which I describe as beg and grovel laws, uh, which is a little bit negative, I guess. But I, what I see, I describe them as beg and grovel laws because basically when people say under these laws, you get the right to die, you don't. You get the right to ask the question. The decision is not yours. The decision is made by the adjudicating body. Now, that's not the same as in Switzerland. In Switzerland, you can get lawful help to die uh, as, long as, that, as long as that assistance is not provided for malicious purpose. And that, give, that puts it back into the rights model. And of course, trying to work out ways to provide, I suppose, innovative ways people can access this right is what uh, Exeter spent a lot of its time doing. Now we spend a lot of time on uh, looking at drugs, looking at better drugs, looking at ways we can uh, store and uh, use better drugs. We've had a, quite a bit to do with the development and use of the new inorganic salts, which have swept, swept the world uh, to such an extent now that we're seeing legislation passed in many places, including reclassification. Now I noticed most recently in New York, uh, of the of the classification of the inorganic salt sodium nitride because of its very useful uh, position in this situation. So I can I'll talk more because I noticed some of the questions that come in about it. Uh, but also my pet project is the Sarco, which is what I would describe as my innovative and stylish way for a person to moment to mark this very important day of your life, the day you die, turning it in perhaps to a sense of celebration or sense of occasion certainly. Because even in the Switzerland, if you want to go to Switzerland, you'll find yourself, uh, well, it's not going to be the most glamorous place. These venues are in the industrial estates of the big cities. Uh, even the one that I'm currently now having a lot to do with, Pegasus, it's not exactly the most uh, uh, salubrious of places. And so you might find yourself in a small room uh, lying on a plastic sheet with some stranger putting a needle in your vein and while you're looking at the ceiling having that peaceful death and certainly you'll be getting access to the best drugs. But I think we can do better than that. And that's the idea of the Sarko where we can make sure that you're overlooking that premier position, the time, the, 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 the scene that you really want to see. It's portable, take it to where you want to use it, climb in and press the button, you wave goodbye and those people that are there marking this sense of with this sense of occasion this important day will say goodbye to you and you move it's it's got a picture many of you will have seen images of the Sarko it gives the idea it's a capsule that it's traveling that it's taking you somewhere we don't know where it's taking you but the idea is that you're getting in and going the rest is staying and waving you goodbye and that project's coming along very well although I must say it's been delayed after delay but we do expect to have that finished sometime in the next few months and have it trialed in Switzerland so on that little bit of a summary of the last 25 years, uh, I hope uh, I've made enough sense for people perhaps to send through some questions and I'll do what I can to answer them. I noticed some have been given to me originally by Barry uh, and I don't know if you want me to start reading them out, Barry, or uh, do you want me to, how do you want to, how do you want to manage the questions? Why don't you start, Philip, with uh, reading out the few that we gave you ahead of time and then, uh, and then let people submit their questions as we go along. Okay, well, that's easy. Now, there are, it's a mixed bunch, the questions. I noticed we're, we're ranging widely on this topic. So we'll start off with question one that you sent to me. The, uh, this is about the debreather. The debreather is ridiculously cheap. 
$190 uh, to ship uh, and purchase. Desirable, uh, um, quick and efficient minutes, painless, can be purchased in advance. Expiration presumed to be five years, expiry, simple to use and can even be practiced and familiarized with ahead of time. So, and this is in block letters, why in the world isn't everybody who's interested in DIY exit, doing it yourself exit, talking about using this device. It seems to me a no-brainer or that makes me suspicious that I might be missing something. Well, that's a, that's a pretty all-encompassing uh, question about the debreather, and I guess that's not going to be everybody's point of interest, but the debreather is a novel, innovative device. The history goes back to uh, people who remember John Hofsess when he was involved early days of setting up of new tech. Uh, the uh, idea of using modified scuba diving equipment uh, whereby a person would breathe through a closed system, breathe down the oxygen level till it became lethal. And by using a nitrogen scrubber removes, uh, not a nitrogen scrubber, a carbon dioxide scrubber removes the carbon dioxide. Look, it was a very good idea in theory, and it certainly has been used and been used successfully. The R2D was recently marketed as uh, an innovative design by Richard Avocet came along and said, I've made some modifications which solve the Bex problem of leakage of the face mask. And it is a problem. We looked at it and thought it was very good and promptly gave him the uh, award at one of the uh, new tech conferences uh, for innovative design. But since that time, it's been marketed to a lot of people. And as this question has just said, if it's as good as it sounds, why isn't everyone using it? But we haven't had any reports of successful use and we've been watching very closely and some of those attempts have been monitored very well and so we've got concerns now about why it's not as effective as we thought it was so many concerns have we that we've decided that we cannot at this stage uh, continue to openly support the idea uh, enthusiastically so what we've done is we've removed that section out of our handbook and put a note in there for people who wish to try, have a look at this, that this might be a good strategy, it might be a good piece of equipment, but for reasons that are yet not fully understood, it doesn't seem to have uh, provided the dream solution that people were hoping for. My own idea about this is it's to do with the slow reduction in oxygen level that causes the difficulty. I'm not exactly sure why, but I, have this idea in my mind that we don't see anything like this when people use an exit bag with nitrogen and you won't see anything like this when we use the Sarco device because these devices drop that level of oxygen from 21% that we're all breathing now down to effectively zero in a matter of seconds. Now that's something that the debreather doesn't do. You effectively have to breathe down the oxygen and that takes time and I suspect it's that time which is causing the issue. So in answer to this question that's come in, I would reserve judgment. I wouldn't be chucking my debriever in the bin just yet, but I would hope to find out more before I would go out there and put all one's end of life eggs in that basket. Uh, that's question one. I can, and the next question is about voluntary cessation of eating and drinking. And the question is that a V said is the go-to answer for competent people who don't qualify for MAID in the US. I don't recall seeing any discussion of V said in your book. I'd like to know your opinion of it and whether there are any steps one could take to hurry the process along like drinking alcohol or salt water or taking drugs to dehydrate faster. This is assuming you are not lucky enough to have a profession, uh, professional medical support in the process. So basically a question about V said and, and I suppose why we haven't included VSED in our handbook? And that's a good question because uh, I've never been terribly enthusiastic uh, about it. Although as I've over the years read more and more about its use, I can see that there are certain aspects to VSED which do have a certain appeal. And one of those obvious comments is that this is a totally lawful process. Uh, I've watched with some interest as the difficulty of people getting the necessary support and comfort that they would need to make them comfortable for the days to weeks that this process might take can be more difficult. Questions about whether you can get hospice support 
because you may not be terminal at the stage uh, when you wish to take go down this path, questions about whether or not advanced directives, if you've got dementia, advanced directives suggesting that you shouldn't be fed or help to eat or dry or fluids provided. How does one establish whether the person has or has not lost mental capacity? So there are problems with the process that takes quite some time and getting the support you may need. And I really, and also one of the other interesting comments is that almost no one suggests this is their first option. So Matt's probably by way of a defense about why it's not in the handbook. Uh, although uh, we're about to republish the uh, handbook uh, because it's become unwieldy. It's more than 550 pages now. It's just getting bigger and bigger because we keep adding to it. But a, a compendium, uh, the essentials is coming out early, early this year, well, in the next few months, which is going to be a summarized version. And we will include a section there on VSED. So in answer to the question, why isn't it there? It's because I haven't been very enthusiastic about it. And I didn't think many people would want to take that step. Uh, but my position has been revised a little over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I think we should indeed have a summary of it and point out some of the some of the issues which I see as problems with this approach. As far as the issue about trying to speed it up, well, I'm not too sure about the idea of drinking salt water to try and speed it up. Look, uh, I, the whole thing sounds ter terribly macabre to me, I must say. Well, when people decide they want to die, they don't usually say to me, look, I want to spend 14 days doing it. This idea about uh, decisions to die, there is usually this idea of methods which lead to quite a quick period of time from the implementation of the policy to loss of consciousness. In fact, that particular time is a very well quantified and important criteria. And when we look at things like the development of the new five drug mix there that you've done in America, very good figures in terms of the time from taking the five drug mixture to the loss of consciousness. And you, when you compare uh, the, the majority of losing consciousness within 30 minutes to uh, taking 14 days to die. Look, I don't know about trying to speed it up using salt water. I, I think if you really want to go down that path, you really do need some good medical attention to make sure that the sedatives to try and help you sleep through the worst of it can be put in place. Ah, that second question. Do you want me to move on to three? We're skipping around a bit here and a totally different one. Now we're looking about the ship of death. Could you briefly tell you tell us about the idea of the death ship in international waters and why you didn't do it? Yes, well, good question. I did have this idea when I was trying to work our ways through what are the international minefield of pieces of legislation on this issue, that perhaps we could actually benefit from being in international waters with a ship that was registered in some country that had a very positive approach to this particular issue. And in the days when I first came across this, what I thought brilliant idea at the time, which is around about 2001, I think when I opened my mouth on this matter and immediately everyone thought it was a crazy idea, but it did attract a lot of attention, most of it negative. But I was suggesting then that we could get hold of a Dutch ship because the Dutch at that stage had did what we thought to be the most progressive legislation in the world. They just brought it in in 2001 and sail it around under Dutch flag and provide people with a wonderful service, uh, a sort of an outreach service by the Dutch. Now, the then Minister for Health, Els Burst in the Netherlands, didn't take kindly to the suggestion and immediately came out with a public statement saying that if anyone's got some crazy idea of registering a ship in the, in the, under, the, in the, under our country's name, we will quickly change the legislation to make sure it never goes ahead. So that sort of put an end to the idea and I sort of dropped it. I had been motivated by the Women on Waves movement where they had been taking and still to this uh, day are very, uh, very effective in the idea of the distribution of uh, uh, contraceptives and the idea of taking uh, services which could be considered to be uh, aids to abortion to different countries like Poland and Ireland and Malta, a ship that they employed to try and take oral contraceptive mifepristone and the other uh, oral termination drugs out and getting them to the women who wanted to have access to abortions. Look, the idea has some merit and it's come up again in recent times. And by recent times, I mean the last six months. Again, people saying that there's a lot of problems with the Dutch law, as I said in one of my earlier comments, we're recently taking people to Switzerland from the Netherlands. And that's because the Netherlands law does have problems and Switzerland makes it easier. Why don't you register a Swiss boat and I thought to myself, a Swiss boat, what the hell do you do with it? Sail around Lake Geneva or something, uh, because they don't actually have a coastline. But you can register a Swiss boat, as it turns out. 
and you can sail it around into international waters. And so the idea again has come up. Uh, why, what about the idea of a Swiss registered vessel and in this case, benefit from what is a very clear piece of legislation which allows a person to get help to die without all that trouble of trying to demonstrate that you're sick enough to qualify. So we're still looking at that. Uh, and it's looking again, like something that needs to be pursued. Thank you, Philip, for being gracious enough to stay up late and, and, <laughs> and spend your time talking to us. It's always such a pleasure to uh, hear from you and to hear your latest thinking on issues. And, uh, and also uh, just a personal note of expression of gratitude for the work you do. I, I, I just think uh, it takes such courage to fight the mainstream uh, and uh, you've been just such a champion of that. And I just want you to know that uh, I, and I'm sure many, many, many others in this group today admire the work you've done and we thank you for being with us. And I guess the last would be another plug for your wonderful book uh, <laughs> that, that anybody who wants to know, for example, about the carbon monoxide, for example, it's in here. Uh, and, and many of the other questions people have are in this book. This is, a, this is of course, a hard copy, easier to read, but uh, the uh, e-copy is more up to date. And so I will get a copy of this book if you're interested in these issues. Uh, one other thing, I guess, I, and you might want to say a word about this, Philip, before we leave is, I think I read where uh, if you are a member of Exit International, you automatically somehow have some... Uh, advantage if you're thinking about Pegasus in Switzerland, is that right? Yeah, that's yeah, that uh, has been the case. And uh, we've been offering some, uh, because it can be quite a, a quite a minefield for people to negotiate the, uh, the, the formal requirements of uh, the Swiss authorities, whereas it may have a very progressive piece of legislation. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved and some people find it quite troubling and we've been able to cooperate and assist and make it a little bit smoother. The pro we don't just restrict ourselves there, but we quite like the, uh, the uh, no frills approach that Pegasus has been able to bring. So that's one of the things. They also you know, need to have witnesses involved and sometimes people cannot or don't have family uh, who want to be with them to witness. You have to have a witness to identify the person who's taken this step. And I may have mentioned that I, two people went from the Netherlands, I went down there to witness their bodies uh, because family members didn't wish to be involved. So that sometimes comes up and Exit provides that sort of service and we get on very well with Rudy Harberger who runs, uh, runs Pegasus. So all, all in all, that's, that's, uh, that's certainly uh, an important thing. I'd like to just say by way of conclusion, thank you very much for the chance to, uh, to talk to you all and answer questions. I came from all aspects of this, uh, this issue and I did like that. We ranged widely over the spectrum of end of life, right to die topics. And I do hope to meet many of you, hopefully in uh, Toronto later this year with the World Federation there in November. So I'm uh, looking forward to something like that. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you again. And uh, I guess we'll close the meeting. Uh, uh, all of you, uh, thanks for coming.